Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me and scheduling this seminar at an unusual time so I could talk to you. Um, so this is some joint work with Matteo Parisi and Lauren Williams, and it's on the archives, so you can find the details um, elsewhere since I won't give most of them in the talk. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll be talking to you about these two mathematical objects, um, the hypersimplex and the m equals 2 amplitudehedron, and kind of a, to me, still very mysterious connection between them. Um, but before I tell you about those two things, I need to tell you about a third mathematical object, which is kind of going to be in the background for this whole talk. Um, and this is the totally non-negative Grassmannian, and probably if you've come around Posh at the right times, you already know about this, but I will tell you anyway. Um, so first, just to set some notation, so I'm going to fix two positive integers, um, k less than n, and I've got some pretty standard notation here. Um, and for me, the Grassmannian GRKn is the real Grassmannian, so it's the set of k-dimensional subspaces of r to the n. Um, and the way I think about these subspaces is totally standard, so um, if someone hands me an element of the Grassmannian, I'm actually going to think about a representative matrix for that subspace, so that's just a full rank k by n matrix whose row span is the subspace in question. Okay, and I like to think about the Grassmannian in this way because I like to think about the Pucher coordinates, which are some functions on the Grassmannian. They're indexed by k element subsets of 1 through n, so pick one of those, call it i. Um, the ith Pucher coordinate, pi of v, is just the maximal minor of one of those representative matrices for V that's located exactly in the column set I. Okay. Um, so, in this talk, I don't care about the entire Grassmannian. I just care about a very special subset of it um, called the totally non-negative Grassmannian, the TNN Grassmannian for short. Um, and this was introduced um, first by Lustig and then later independently and in quite different language by Posnikov. Um, but the definition is the same. And what this subspace is, um, or what the subset is, it's just all elements of the Grassmannian whose Pucher coordinates are non-negative. Okay, so um, there are a lot of nice stories I could tell you about the TNN Grassmannian, and I'm not really going to tell you any of them because I need to get to these other two objects instead. <laughs> but what I will tell you is that it comes um, with a very natural stratification, just in two pieces according to like which Pucher coordinates are positive and which ones are zero. So to be a little bit more precise, um, so choose some collection of k element subsets of n, let's call it m. Then I have a stratum s sub m in the TNN Grassmannian, and it's all those elements um, whose, where the Pucher coordinate p sub i is positive if and only if i is in the collection I picked. M. So m is recording the positive Pucher coordinates, the complement of m is recording the, the zero Pucher coordinates. And let me give you a quick example. So I am interested in the stratum um, where I'm going to take, I want my positive Pucher coordinates to be all two element subsets of 4 except for the subset 1, 2. Okay, so it turns out this stratum, it consists of um, subspaces with representative matrices that look like this. Where A, B, and C are positive real numbers. So that's so if you look at this matrix, you can see um, the minor 1, 2 is 0, but all of the other minors will be positive. Okay, so that's one of these strata. Um, and if you choose, okay, so if you choose your collection M unwisely, then your stratum will be empty. That's fine, we throw, we don't care about those. Um, but if your stratum is not empty, then this collection M of subsets is called a positroid of type Kn. So this word positroid, it's a portmanteau of positive and matroid, or maybe positively realizable in matroid. Um, the type Kn just is telling you we're inside of the Grassmannian GRKn. Okay, and then the stratum Sm is called a positroid cell. Um, and I switched language here, um, so I said the word cell, and that's not a mistake. These things really are cells, so they're homeomorphic to open balls, so topologically really nice. And as I said, um, kind of by definition, we have this decomposition of the TNN Grassmannian into the disjoint union of all these positroid cells. So this is the space that's going to be living in the background for this whole talk. Um, and I'll say this cell decomposition is actually really nice. It's a regular CW complex, which is a result due to Tasha, Thomas Lamb, and Sue. Okay, so in the background we have this regular CW complex. 
Now, to get the two objects that I'm actually interested in, the hypersimplex and the amplitohedron, I'm going to take this CW complex and I'm going to hit it with two different maps. Um, one of these maps is going to give me the hypersimplex, the other map will give me the amplitohedron. And let me start on the hypersimplex side. So I'm, I'm going <laughs> to apologize in advance, kind of. So this is the least friendly way to define the hypersimplex imaginable, I think. Uh, but I will give you some examples a couple slides on. So I'm doing it this way for the sake of analogy, so bear with me for a second. OK, so for the hypersimplex side, the map of interest is the moment map. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, it actually doesn't matter too much how it's defined. Um, it's kind of notable in combinatorics in work of Gelfand, Gretzky, McPherson, Serganova on matroid polytopes. But um, for this talk, what you really need to know is um, we're thinking of this as some map from the TNN Grossmannian or k plus 1 comma n into just r to the n. Sorry? Oh, yes, this is a, a factor that's long, <laughs> and so I abbreviated it. But it's actually, it's like the sum of squares of all points. Um, okay, so how do you obtain the hypersimplex? Well, you just take the moment map image of the TNN Grossmannian. And that's not a good, <laughs> that's not, that's not very helpful to say that, but um, like I said, I'll give you an example and a better description a couple of slides on. But what I will tell you right now is that um, this hypersimplex is n minus one dimensional and it's a polytope. I'll give you its vertices. Okay, so that's, the hypersimplex side. Now, to get the amplitohedron, okay, so first I should tell you the amplitohedron um, was defined by two physicists, um, Arkani Hamid and Trinka. And so they're interested in computing something called scattering amplitudes, which roughly speaking is it's a function which tells you the probability that some particles that are zooming around smash together and scatter into new particles. So the idea behind the amplitohedron is that, in a very rough sense, something like its volume should actually be a scattering amplitude. Okay, so for us, it's just going this amplitohedron is just going to be an object, and um, we know that we care about something like its volume for physical reasons. Okay, so how do you actually define it? Well, first, um, I need to pick some helper matrix Z. So this is going to be an n by k plus two matrix with positive maximal minors. Okay, so I've chosen this matrix. Um, it induces a map called Z tilde on the TNN Grossmannian just via matrix multiplication. So what does this map do? It takes some element of the TNN Grossmannian represented by matrix A, and it sends it um, to a point in another Grossmannian represented by the matrix A times Z. So this point sits inside of GRK K plus two. Okay, cool. So we have this map from the TNN Grossmannian into another Grossmannian, and its image is just what we call the M equals two amplitude. Okay, so what can I tell you about this space? Well, first, the hedron suffix here is basically a lie. Um, this is not a polytope, except for like one parameter value. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's just kind of like aspirational or something to call it an amplitude hedron. Um, the other thing I can tell you is that it's full dimensional in the ambient Grossmannian, so it's 2K dimensional. Not polytope, usually. Okay, so those are the objects that I'm going to be drawing this analogy between. Um, and in particular, so on both sides, right, I had a TNN Grossmannian and I mapped it over. So I can also talk about the images of the positroid cell. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so, okay, so for Zoom, the question was, is the m equals 2 amplitudehedron independent of Z? I mean, the answer is no one knows. So the physicists think that the important properties of the amplitudehedron should be independent of Z, uh, but there aren't really proofs of this fact. They've done extensive computer checks. The, the conjecture is that all of the combinatorics I'm going to talk about does not depend on Z. Um, we will see. I'll, I'll say some things about that. <laughs> Kind of two kind of not. Yeah. Sure. 
<laughs> All right, so for Zoom, Igor is telling me that Hedrin is a fine name. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's fair. Well, we'll see. I'll give a, a different description of this, and we can talk about how close it is to something that is a hedron or not. OK, so um, okay. So I said, now let's look at the positroid cells and look at their images under these two maps. Um, so I'm just going to give some names to these. So if I take the moment map image of a positroid cell closure, I get a polytope called a positroid polytope. It's just some polytope sitting inside of the hypersimplex. I'll give you a better description in a second. On the amplitudehedron side, um, if I take the Z tilde image of a positroid cell closure, I get something called a grass tope. This is a portmanteau of Grassmann and polytope, which is some terminology that Thomas Lamb came up with. OK, um, and again, uh, <laughs> we can talk about what <laughs> if tope is deserved or not, whatever. Let's move on. <laughs> OK, so in this story, I'm going to care particularly about a special class of grass topes, which from the physics side are the best behaved. So um, these I'm going to call positroid tiles for the amplitudehedron. And um, OK, so what are they? They're full dimensional grass topes, so 2K dimensional, um, where the Z tilde map was injective on the positroid cell that the grass tope came from. So the idea is, is that these are grass topes that are quite close to positroid cells, um, and they're also big. <laughs> they're the biggest ones that are like that. OK. and. Um, I can make an exactly analogous definition on the moment map side. So a positroid tile for the hypersimplex is a full dimensional, i.e. n minus 1 dimensional positroid polytope um, where the moment map mu was injective on the positroid. OK, so why do the physicists care about these positroid tiles? Um, well, it's because they're trying to compute this like volume-like thing. And for the amplitudehedron, it's a large shape. It's large and mysterious. Its volume is hard to compute. Um, but for these positroid tiles, it's a bit easier to compute their volumes. So um, what physicists are really interested in are, are positroid tilings. So these are um, decompositions of the amplitudehedron into positroid tiles. Um, and the positroid tiles should have disjoint interiors. OK, and um, I'm, because I'm going to say that if you care about computing something that's like the volume of the amplitudehedron, this is exactly the kind of decomposition you should consider, right? So you have a big space. You're cutting it up into small pieces whose volumes you understand. And you want this cutting to be good, so you don't want the small pieces to like overlap in their interiors. So from the physics perspective, this is like a totally reasonable thing to care about. Um, and I'm going to make, again, an exactly analogous definition on the hypersimplex side, so a positroid tiling of the hypersimplex um, is some decomposition into positroid tiles with disjoint interiors. OK. And um, OK, I will admit, on the hypersimplex side, this notion is a bit weirder. Um, when we have a polytope, we like to think about polyhedral subdivisions of this polytope. So cutting it into smaller polytopes so that any intersection is a face of both. Um, we're not making any boundary assumptions here. So all I'm saying is I'm going to cut the hypersimplex up into pieces. I don't care if I have like edges that are kind of intersecting like this. Um, so yeah, from a combinatorial perspective, I don't know if you really want to consider all of these positroid tilings. But there are nice ones among here, which are kind of honest polyhedral subdivisions. So kind of as a special case, you get this. That's great. Yeah, and so, yeah, I'll, OK. So these are my two sides. Um, I'm going to tell you the relationship between them. I'm insisting on this analogy. But first, let me uh, give you some examples so you understand what I'm talking about. OK, so first, a better description of um, the hypersimplex. So some notation. If i is a subset of n, then e sub i is just the indicator vector of that subset. So it's a 0, 1 vector with 1s in the positions um, indexed by i. OK, so the hypersimplex delta k plus 1 n is just the convex hull of all 0, 1 vectors with exactly k plus 1 1. So it's really easy to talk about its vertices. Here's a picture 
of delta Q4, so its vertices are indexed by the two element subsets of four. Okay, so the positroid polytopes also have a nice vertex description. Um, so gamma M, positroid polytope indexed by the positroid M, is just the convex hull of the indicator vectors of all the elements of M. So um, all you're doing basically to get a positroid polytope is you're taking the hypersimplex and you're throwing away those vertices that don't correspond to elements of M. So like here's a positroid polytope. Um, it corresponds to the example of a positroid cell I gave before. And uh, this is just to warn you, you can't throw away, like if you just throw away arbitrary vertices of the hypersimplex, you won't necessarily get a positroid polytope. Of course, these are special, so like this is not positroid. Okay, so um, is there a question? No, okay. So yeah, I also have a better description to give you of the positroid tiles for the hypersimplex. Um, it turns out they're just the smallest full dimensional positroid polytope. This is a result of Lukowski, Parisi, and Williams. So um, this also means that it's kind of easier to think about the positroid tiling. It's just, oh, how do you break up the hypersimplex into these smallest full dimensional positroid polytope pieces? So it's, you know, we're, we're talking about um, like finest positroidal dissections here. Okay, and then um, we also have a good understanding of kind of the nicest subclass of tilings, uh, which are actually polyhedral subdivisions. Um, it turns out there's this object called the positive dressian. So this is a, a complete polyhedral fan. Um, and each maximal cone in this fan gives you a positroid tiling. It gives you one of these, pos um, these fine positroidal subdivisions, and, and that's all of them. So um, this is work of Arkani Hamid, Lamb and Spradlin, and separately, Byron Williams. So the thing I want you to take away from this slide is, on the hypersimplex, we have everything figured out. <laughs> on the hypersimplex side, we know what's going on. We have good intrinsic descriptions of all of, of the hypersimplex, these tiles, and we also have some kind of global understanding of a nice class of positroid tilings. Okay, and I'm making this point because, um, of course, on the amplitudehedron side, before our results, uh, we knew a lot less. So Pasha asks, do you get all tilings or just all regular tilings from the positive dressian? And yeah, you only get the regular ones. Yeah, so, uh, but I don't know. From a mathematical perspective, maybe those are the ones you want to focus on anyway, even if the physicists want to consider a broader class. Okay, so now the amplitudehedron side. Um, so I'll say, so this is what I could tell you uh, before we wrote the paper. <laughs> so. Basically, I could give you a nice description of the amplitudehedron only for two parameter values. Um, the first one is when k plus 2 is equal to n. So in that situation, um, this z matrix is square. So the z tilde map is an isomorphism. And so the amplitudehedron is just isomorphic to T and Grossmannian. Um, in this situation, there's only one positroid tile for dimension reasons, and so the tilings are also <laughs> explainable. <laughs> um, the other parameter value where we know what's going on is for k equals one. And in this situation, the amplitudehedron actually is a polytope. <laughs> it's just a polygon sitting inside of the projective plane. And um, I can actually tell you exactly what its vertices are. They'll be the rows of the Z matrix and, and they'll be arranged kind of clockwise like this. And in this situation, the positroid tiles are triangles on three vertices of the, of the polygon. And so the tilings are actually triangulations. But aside from these parameter values before we wrote this paper, I cannot tell you um, any, like I can't tell you an intrinsic description of the amplitudehedron as just a subset of GRK K plus two. And I also can't give you that much information about the tilings. What I can do is I can give you, um, there's a recursion due to Bao and He, which will produce positroid tilings for you. Um, it doesn't produce all of them and you know, it's a recursion. So you don't have any global understanding of what's going on. You have a recursive understanding. Okay. So um, now let me tell you what we know now. So this was before the paper. Um, okay, it'll take me a little while to get there. But um, so this connection, but this analogy between the hypersimplex and the m equals two amplitudehedron was first conjectured by Lukowski, Parisi, and Williams. And basically, um, Matteo Parisi and Tomek Lukowski 
they were doing computations on the amphitohedron side, and they got numbers that Lauren Williams recognized on the hypersimplex side. Okay, so what do they, what is their conjecture? So they defined something called t-duality, um, which is just a correspondence um, between, on the one hand, some positroid polytopes sitting inside of delta k plus 1 gamma n, and some grass topes sitting inside of a n k 2 c. Um, I'm not going to give you the details of this correspondence, but I'm, I'm just going to notate it like this. So um, this positroid polytope gamma m is t dual to this grass tope v m hat. Okay, so the point of t-duality is that they conjectured it's going to exactly match up the positroid tiles for the hypersimplex with the positroid tiles for the amphitohedron. So the idea here is that for some reason um, there's a parallel between cells on which the moment map is well behaved and cells on which this v tilde map is well behaved. But they're cells from different Grassmannians. So it's kind of it's kind of a it's a very funny thing to say. Um, it's um, yeah, I want to emphasize that this, this relation, when they conjectured it, it's, it's not geometric. They don't have like a map from some positroid polytope to whatever the t-dual grass tope is. They just say, I should take this positroid polytope and I should match it up with this grass tope. And for some reason, when I do that, uh, the positroid tiles on both sides get matched together. And they further conjectured um, that this t-duality, this bijection between positroid tiles, it actually induces a bijection between positroid tilings, the t size. Um, yeah, so spoiler, our results are that both of these things are true. <laughs> um, but so I want to, but before going into that, I want to pause for a second. Um, first, I'll say um, they provide, so one thing they do is they, they show this direction of the bijection um, for positroid tiles, but this direction they don't know. And they also provide um, some support for, uh, for their second conjecture. Um, but OK, why is this sort of thing like alluring? Well, one thing is that it's just really weird. <laughs> like on the one hand, you have this polytope and how to and you're like decomposing this polytope into smaller polytopes. And on the other, you have um, this amphitohedron, which is some curvy subspace, the two maps, the moment map and the z tilde map, don't seem to have anything to do with each other. But somehow, these decompositions, um, they seem to match up. And the other reason why one might care about this is because, well, as I tried to convince you earlier, we know pretty well what's going on on the hypersimplex side. On the amphitohedron side, we do not. So um, one reason this is attractive is you can take all of the tools of convex geometry, which you can use over here, and somehow you can obtain information um, about this non-convex amplitude. Okay, so like I said, um, our results are that these things are true. So we show that there's a bijection between the positroid tiles for the two spaces. And kind of even better, <clears throat> what we do is we give an inequality description of each one of the amplitudehedron tiles. So we say, okay, here's your amplitudehedron tile. It's just the subset of GRKK plus 2 cut out by blah many inequalities. Um, and so this is the first time that we have any kind of intrinsic description of any grass tope. And as you can imagine, uh, knowing exactly what subset you're talking about, it really helps you prove things. <laughs> um, so we're able to resolve some old conjectures. Um, the other kind of interesting thing about this is the inequality description we give of, of these amplitudehedron tiles it's exactly parallel to the inequality description for the corresponding positroid tile. Um, so the inequalities themselves aren't the same, but you're using precisely the same information to write them down. Um, and we, we don't know how to explain that. I, ju I just think it's like, it's very interesting. It kind of hints at something deeper going on geometrically that I don't really know what it is. Um, okay, so that's the result on tiles. And then, as I said, our result on tilings is that, yes, this bijection on tiles induces a bijection between positroid tilings. Um, in particular, the, the relevant tilings for the amplitohedron are the ones that work for all z. This kind of answers the question of like, what combinatorics of the amplitohedron depends on z and what doesn't? Well, 
maybe there are extra tilings of the amplitohedron, we don't know, but the ones that work for all of the um, are exactly the ones that correspond to the pulsatory tiling. Okay, so I'm gonna pause for questions. Um, so you're asking, like, if I know the volume of this polytope, do I know the volume of this graphtope? Um, that's a great question, and I have no idea. Um, so the way that this, right, the, yeah, maybe something like that could be extracted from this information, um, but yeah, a priori, no. I think so. Um, we actually get, we construct something that does depend on Z in, in, the, uh, in the course of our proofs. And it sort of, it turns out that it like doesn't matter, <laughs> um, but it has made me very suspicious. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think it's a subtle question at least. Oh yeah, for Zoom, Pasha asked if I believed that things really don't depend on Z. And then the question before that was, can I extract volume information from here to here? So um, let me tell you a little bit more about these results. So um, what we do when we show this bijection between tiles is we actually show that tiles on both sides are in bijection with a nice combinatorial object. Um, and it's a combinatorial object that looks like this. So this is a properly bicolored subdivision of an n-gon with area k. Okay, so this subdivision part that means what you think it is. I've taken my polygon, I break it up into smaller polygons um, using like some arcs, some diagonals of the polygon. This properly bicolored thing means my sub polygons are colored black and white, and I shouldn't have any polygons, sub polygons of the same color sharing an edge. And then this area K is just recording basically how much of my big polygon is colored in black. Okay, so if someone hands me one of these, um, I can produce for you a tile for both the amplitohedron and the hypersimplex. Um, let me talk about the amplitohedron one. Um, and to do that, so I'm going to read the inequality information off of this picture. Um, and the inequalities that I'll give you, they're in terms of some they're functions that aren't Puga coordinates, and so they're twister coordinates. So let me define those first. Okay, so um, pick some point in GRKK plus two, and let zi denote the ith row of z. Um, the twister coordinate, yij, is just the determinant of the matrix where I put y on top, then followed by the ith row of z, followed by the jth row of z. This is a square matrix, I can just take its determinant. So, so this function, this twister coordinate, it's some linear function in the Pucher coordinates of y. So, and, um, I should say quickly, we didn't pull these twister coordinates out of nowhere. Um, they featured in this conjecture of Arkani, Hamid, Thomas, and Trinka on how to describe the amplitohedron just as a subset of GRKK plus two. This is one of the things we can prove, so I'm just going to flash this on the screen now, come back to it later. Um, the point is, is that twister coordinates appear over there, so you know, one gets the idea you should think about twister coordinates to describe things in the amplitude. So now let me um, give you this inequality description of each positroid tile. Okay, so someone hands you one of these bicolored subdivisions, and to produce a description of the corresponding tile, first you want to choose a triangulation of all of the black polygons in this subdivision. So the subdivision would be uh, this picture without this 1, 4 diagonal, and to get a triangulation, I put that 1, 4 there. Okay, so the way this description works is there's one inequality for each arc of a black triangle in my triangulation. So let me let me pick one of these arcs. Say it's the arc from one to four. Okay. So this inequality is going to tell me the sign of the twister coordinate y14. So it's going to be like negative one to the something times y14. Okay, and what's this exponent? Um, it's a really easy combinatorial statistic, which we call the area. 
Um, so this area from I to J is just the number of black triangles that are to the left of I to J. OK, so in this example, my exponent, so I compute it by looking at this arc. How many black triangles are to the left of this arc? Just one. So my inequality here is that y14 is negative. And I just keep computing. I just compute one of these inequalities for each arc of the black triangle, and that completely describes the tile. So really straightforward <laughs> when you have one of these pictures. I mean, I should say um, this choice of triangulation doesn't matter. So if I choose a different one, I'll get what looks like a different description, but it will be equivalent. OK, and um, how do I get, so that's the amplitohedron tile. How do I get the hypersimplex tile? Well, I'm going to use exactly the same information, this area statistic. But now it's going to bound coordinate sums of like consecutive coordinates of a vector in Rn. So that's the description. So these, these tiles are not very complicated subsets of GRK k plus 2. And um, now that we know exactly what they are, we can prove this conjecture of our Connie Hamid, Thomas, and Trinka on exactly what the amplitudehedron looks like just as a subset of GRK k plus 2. So what is it? Well, it's just the closure of those elements of GRK k plus 2 where n Kluger, uh, sorry, n twister coordinates are positive, and a particular sequence of n twister coordinates has k sign changes. So this part, sure, that seems like those are spaces. I don't know about this part um, in terms of like, does it deserve to be called called a hedron or not? Yeah, one thing I can say is. Um, the tilings that we come up with, they are like connected in co-dimension one. So you don't have any like funny behavior where there's like part of the amplitudehedron and then it touches another part of the amplitudehedron just at a point. You do have like, yeah, so that's kind of polyhedral, but anyway. Okay, so this is one of the things we can prove. Um, we also find some connections to cluster algebras, which I don't really want to talk about. Um, if you're interested, I can talk to you about them afterwards. We find some cluster varieties, some new cluster varieties in GRK k plus 2. Um, and the positive parts of these cluster varieties are exactly the positroid tile. Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't know. My instinct is that they should be generic, but I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. Um, OK, so now let me talk about our tilings results. OK, so this is just to remind you, um, what is a positroid tiling of either space? Well, it's some choice of positroid tiles whose interiors are disjoint and whose union is the whole thing. And remember, we have some nice combinatorial object, the positive dressing in the background on the hypersimplex side, that gives us some information about tiles or tiling. And on the amplitudehedron side, we don't really know anything outside of k equals 1 in kind of a global way. OK, so our result here, right, is we have this bijection between positroid tilings for the amplitudehedron that work for all z and positroid tilings for the hypersimplex. Here's a, a picture of what's going on. So. Here's the two positroid tilings of this hypersimplex. Um, let's focus on this one. So like, you know, the blue part is a positroid tile. The green part is a positroid tile. The corresponding graph topes on the amplitudehedron, well, for this green tile, um, that corresponds to this green triangle over here. So indeed, if you take the positroid tiles over here and you look at their corresponding positroid tiles to the amplitudehedron, you do get a tiling. So this is the only case I can draw, but uh, this works all the time. OK, so how do we prove something like this? Well, um, what we do is on both sides, we take the simultaneous refinement of all positroid tilings. So that breaks up each space into even smaller pieces. 
And then we kind of cross our fingers and hope that those smaller pieces are also in bijection. Um, and it turns out that this is not really true, but it's close enough to true <laughs> that we can, we can prove this statement. OK, so um, I'm going to give a bit more detail about this. So first, on the hypersimplex side, what do you get if you take the simultaneous refinement of all positroid tilings? So, right, that means I'm taking every hyperplane that bounded one of my tiles, and I'm cutting up the hypersimplex using all of those hyperplanes at once. Um, what you obtain is actually something classical, so it falls from results of Lam and Posnikov, that what you get is just a triangulation of the hypersimplex. So that is a decomposition into simplices. Um, and this is this was uh, this triangulation was first studied by Stanley and then in a different guise by Sturmfels and then later by Lam and Paul. Okay, and so this triangulation is is quite nice. Um, its maximal simplices are indexed by uh, permutations of n minus one with k descents. So there are Eulerian number many of these maximal simplices. I'm going to call I'm going to call these W simplices. So they're indexed by some permutation. Okay, so um, and Lam and Posnikov give lots of different ways of thinking about these W simplices. So this hypersimplex story we understand pretty well. Okay, so the goal now is to break up the amplitudehedron into Eulerian number many pieces. Okay, so well, if I'm taking the simultaneous refinement of all positroid triangulations of the amplitudehedron, okay, so the sorry positroid tilings. Um, okay, so the tiles are cut out by these hypersurfaces, right? Like the, some twister coordinate is equal to zero. So if I cut the amplitudehedron with all of those simultaneously, the pieces I'm left with are places where all twister coordinates have a specified sign, right? So the little pieces I'm getting, they're sign chambers. So um, give like a more formal definition. What you do to get one of these little pieces of the amplitudehedron is you specify some sign vector, epsilon. And then delta hat epsilon is those elements of the amplitudehedron where the twister coordinate yij has the sign specified by epsilon i. Let me take closure. Okay, so um, you might be worried now because I have way, way, way more sign chambers than Eulerian numbers. Um, but it's okay because these twister coordinates are not algebraically independent. They satisfy three-term Fugger relations, and so many choices of sign vector are just impossible. Um, so yeah, so we have that the amplitudehedron is the union of all of these sign chambers, but in fact, in this union, many sign chambers are empty. So the real point is we need to figure out exactly which one ones of them are not, and um, we want to index those. <laughs> those non-empty sign chambers exactly by these permutations of n minus 1 with k. OK, and so that's what we do. So we're going to define special sign chambers indexed by these permutations, and then we'll show that they're the only ones that can be non-empty. Um, and this is kind of a mess, <laughs> this definition. So what is what are these special sign chambers? So um, I'm going to call it a W chamber. W is one of these permutations. And the takeaway from this is just uh, in a W chamber, the sign of twister coordinates is specified in some way by a statistic of W. And it's not very complicated. Uh, this is small because you're not really supposed to. <laughs> so we can define a W chamber for each one of these uh, permutations of n minus 1 with k descents. And like here's an example. So here's a particular uh, W simplex in the hypersimplex. The corresponding W chamber in the amplitudehedron is this piece. Um, yeah, and so I'll say a priori, just looking at this definition of a W chamber, it's not clear, um, right? It's not clear that it's non-empty, and it's not clear that there couldn't be other sign chambers which are non-empty. Mm. But in fact, these W chambers cover all of the sign chambers that are non-empty. So the amplitudehedron is really the union of all of these W chambers. Um, there's a subtlety though, which is that depending on V a W chamber might be empty. Um, and this is this like weird Z dependence that suddenly pops up. Um, and it turns out not to matter. So let me uh, keep telling this story. So, okay, so we have this weird thing where in this union, not all of the pieces are non-empty. So it's sort of analogous to this decomposition of the hypersimplex, but also kind of not. 
Um, but as long as your W chamber is non-empty, um, inclusion of W chambers in a pulsatory tile is exactly the same as inclusion of a W simplex in a pulsatory tile on this. So in the situation where W chambers are non-empty, kind of everything is working exactly as we want. Um, w chamber sits inside a pulsatory tile of the amphitohedron if and only if the corresponding W simplex sits inside the pulsatory tile for the height. Okay, so, but the problem is, um, right, sometimes, depending on Z, a W chamber might be empty. Okay, so why, what is going on? Oh, yeah. Um, so, that cannot happen. So, um, this, yeah, this, uh, so I define the W chambers as like the closure of some open subset. Yeah, I kind of glossed over that. Um, that triangle will come back to. That's right. So, I guess, yeah, I guess the point is, is that, um, okay, yeah, I, what I should say, I suppose, is that if some of these are lower dimensional, then it won't matter because they'll be contained in the closures, like they'll be contained in some other W chambers. So, yeah. Yeah, so we kind of, I guess I think about throwing them away from the union as soon as they become something lower dimensional. Okay, yeah, so what is the deal with this? Um, what is the deal with this emptiness? Well, um, Pasha kind of has already pointed it out. So let's uh, just think about the amplitudehedron we can draw on the plane. So that's, um, that's the k equals one amplitudehedron. So in this situation, those hyperplanes where twister coordinates vanish, um, those are actually just the diagonals um, from one vertex of my polygon to another. So when I'm taking this decomposition into sine chambers, all I'm doing is I'm drawing all of the diagonals of these of the polygon, and I'm taking the complement of all those diagonals. Those will be my sine. Um, so, okay, so here is a W simplex. Right? It's a connected component of that complement of diagonals. And so this is described by, sorry, it's a W chamber. It's described by being on like a particular side of each one of these diagonals, right? So it, it needs to be on like that side of that diagonal and this side of that diagonal and this side of that one. But as we change Z, so remember the, the vertices of this polygon are the rows of Z. So as I change Z, like for example, I take Z1 and I drag it over, I'm going to be shrinking this W chamber until eventually it becomes empty, right? So um, until there, there will be no points satisfying this, the, like you have to be on this side of this hyperplane and this side of this hyperplane and this side of that. Um, yeah, so, so in fact, for most amplitudehedron, there does not exist a Z for which all W chambers are simultaneously non-empty. Um, but what we managed to show is that for each W, you can find some Z so that that W chamber is non-empty. And uh, that's enough to show this tilings result. It's why we pick up the like, the tilings that work for all Z. We kind of pick up the, yeah, the ones that don't depend on Z. All possible chambers are treated in the unit. number of those is given by the original. That's right. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, if you right, if you just pick, if you fix the z, then the number of chambers you see will well just depend on <laughs> on what z you picked exactly. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, yeah. So that's that's the way we prove this tilings result um, is by this kind of sort of bijection between pieces of the amplitudehedron, small pieces of the amplitudehedron, and small pieces of the hypersimplex. Um, so if I look at, at that triangle, can mm -hmm. you? Give me this permutation right away, or is it just get on? Um, yeah, it takes a little bit of work. Um, it's in our paper somewhere, though. Yeah. 
Um, okay, and so that's um, those are all the new results that I wanted to tell you about. Um, so I will say that this this raises uh, many more questions about the amplitudehedron. Um, one question is just so we were paying attention to these tilings, so a particular kind of decomposition on both sides. And so one question is, well, do you still get a correspondence when you change what kind of decomposition you're looking at? So what if you want to think about polyhedral subdivisions on the hypersimplex side? Uh, do you get a correspondence to some kind of subdivision of the amplitudehedron? Or like, what if you don't just want to think about tiles as your pieces? What if you want to think about arbitrary positroid polytopes or grass topes? Do you still get a, um, a correspondence? So those are both really good questions. Um, another kind of question you can ask is, how nice is the nicest positroid tiling of the amplitudehedron? So for example, um, is it a cell decomposition? I'm being a bit sloppy here. So <laughs> uh, positroid tilings I'm only talking about. The, I really only specified the top dimensional um, pieces, but, I, but you know, I think it's, um, this is still the question I want to ask. You just have to fill in some data. Okay, and then the last question, um, maybe of most interest to physicists is, well, okay, the amplitudehedron is actually only physically meaningful when m is equal to four, uh, because space-time is four-dimensional. So I told you the m equals two story, um, which is like, I think physicists think about it as like the, the toy model that's gonna help us with m equals four. <laughs> so one really good question, especially for the, that physicists are very interested in is, well, what extends to other m? Maybe they care particularly about m equals four, but as mathematicians, we can say, well, what about arbitrary m? Um, and yeah, this is both a question of like what techniques of ours extend, and also just like which like kind of styles of results extend. So can you find some object like the hypersimplex, but for the m equals four? Um, yeah, and that's all I have. So thanks so much for listening.